Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, The Evolving Engineer. My name is Amanda. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders, past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's University Partner, University of New South Wales. UNSW is one of Australia's leading research and teaching universities. At UNSW, their teaching gains strength and currency through research activities, strong industry links and their international nature. UNSW has a strong regional and global engagement. In developing new ideas and promoting lasting knowledge, UNSW creates an academic environment where outstanding students and scholars from around the world can be inspired to excel in their programs of study and research. Partnerships with both local and global communities allow UNSW to share knowledge, debate and research outcomes. UNSW's public events include concert performances, open days and public forums on issues such as the environment, healthcare and global politics. Today we will hear from our panel in an insightful discussion followed by an audience Q&A session and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box during today's presentations. I would now like to welcome our moderator for today, Pamela Henderson, Executive Director, Technical Services at Transport for New South Wales. In her role, Pamela provides specialised technical capability and services for the multimodal delivery, operations and management of the transport network and focuses on innovation and driving best practice in engineering. Prior to joining Joining Transport New South Wales, Pamela worked in the energy industry for 25 years and led a range of projects and teams, including planning of the electricity network, reliability and technical stewardship and delivery of one of the federally funded Smart Grid Smart City program. In roles including Chief Engineer and General Manager Customer and Corporate Services, Pamela led the delivery of a number of next generation IT and OT systems and introduced genuine customer engagement for internal and regulatory decisions. Pamela has established, Pamela has established a team equipped with technical leadership and competency for project portfolio with a focus on driving technical innovation for financial and environmental sustainability, improving and planning for the future through digital engineering and cultivating a more diverse talent pool. Please join me in welcoming Pamela Henderson. Thank you, Amanda, and hello and welcome to all of our viewers today. I'd likewise like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. I'm joining the webinar from the beautiful, beautiful lands of the Wongal clan of the Darug people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to welcome our first panellist for today, who is Professor Ian Gibson. Professor Ian Gibson is the Deputy Dean, Industry Engagement, Innovation and Research in the Faculty of Engineering at UNSW here in Sydney. Professor Gibson has over 30 years of experience as a computer scientist and engineer and at an executive level in the R&D management. He's led the research, development and global commercialisation of new technology across a broad range of electrical engineering, computer science and digital imaging. He was also the founding CEO of Intersect Australia from 2008 to 2015. Prior to that, he was the general manager at CISRA, the Australian R&D lab for Canon, where he built research capability over 14 years to deliver world leading technology into a wide range of Canon's major product groups, generating hundreds of patents along the way. Please join me in welcoming Ian Gibson, who will be opening today's topic. Thank you.
let me just get ready. Thanks very much, Pamela, and welcome everybody. Um, I've been asked today to give um, an introduction to the topic. So the topic of the day is the evolving engineer. And I guess at the core of this topic is the question, how as an engineer do I evolve? How do I need to change in order to stay at the top of my profession? Well, I don't think there's much of an argument really that the rate of change of knowledge required in our profession is ever increasing. Technological change across almost all fields follows long-term exponential improvements. Uh, for me, I'm an electrical engineer and I design large-scale integrated circuits. And ever since these things have existed in the 1950s, uh, Moore's law has held. And you're probably aware of Moore's law. It was introduced by Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel. And it states that the density of digital integrated circuits doubles every 18 months. And remarkably, it holds today, after all those years. But for decades, people have been saying it can't possibly continue. We're at the physical limits now. But guess what? It does keep going and it's still going today. And, but what is really interesting is why. The, the, the reason is that the semiconductor industry knows that it's, this is the future benchmark and everybody in industry knows that everybody else, all their competitors are planning to try and beat Moore's law because that's where the technological advantage in the market will lie. And so it's a self-reinforcing, self-prophecy, I suppose, for the industry. And uh, everybody in the industry invests like crazy to try and beat it. So it's, it's, a, it's a classic first order feedback control system. It will keep going for the foreseeable future. And people will come up with more and more clever ways of cramming more and more active devices into a small, small space. But I have seen similar, but even better rates of improvement in other industries. The point though for me is that during my professional career, the technological change has been so fast that the tools, technologies and engineering processes They've had to change quite substantially on almost every single project year on year. And that's normal. And I think most of us would find that normal. The specifics, of course, will change from industry to industry. But as an engineer, we needed, I needed to, and we all need to adapt a whole suite of new tools, technologies, and processes pretty much constantly. Um, you might say that your industry doesn't change that quickly, and that may be so, but if you factor in all the other uh, factors that are forcing change, legislative change, international supply chain dynamics, marketing communications, not to mention, of course, the dramatic changes we've all faced with, with COVID and related matters. It's a huge long list. Look, you've probably heard all this before, but it, what's really important to remember is your competitors are also changing. So you will stay at the top of your game if you learn and you change at least as fast as them and preferably quicker. So what do I mean by uh, stay at the top of your game? Well, well, that means different things to different people. To some, it means just meeting professional responsibilities. It could mean achieving career aspirations. If you're in a business, it'll be about making more money and getting more clients, or it could be about making the world a better place uh, faster. Personally, for me, it's all of these. This is why I became an engineer. But of course, what I'm saying is probably well understood by engineers in general. As you may know, to retain, retain chartered, chartered status or as, a, as a registered engineer, you need to do 150 continuous professional development hours, CPD hours per year. Given that there are about uh, 1,500 hours in a working year, that's 10% of your time. So that's a pretty substantial undertaking. I'd like to think that the commitment that a profession makes to minimum standards of ongoing learning is in some way a measure of their commitment to doing a decent job. Given that the CPD requirements for chartered status is 150 hours per year, I'm wondering if anyone can actually guess what the CPD requirements are for a medical practitioner, for a GP, for example. You might be surprised to find it's only 50 hours a year, which is a third of engineers. For accountants, it's 40 hours a year. For company directors, it's 20 hours a year. Can anyone guess what it is for lawyers? And this is not a lawyer joke, but for lawyers, it's 10 hours a year, which is a very small fraction of what engineers are required to do. And that is a reflection of the pace of change and the complexity of their profession versus our profession. So engineering as a profession has always had strong lifelong learning culture. 
way more so than other professions. So I guess the essential question is um, that we all face, with my limited spare time, what are the most important things I should learn to keep current and at the top of my profession? In broad terms, I can answer that on the basis of what employers tell us they're looking for in graduates. Up until about, 20, say, 20 years ago, technical mastery reigned supreme. That is, the engineer with the best technical knowledge was considered the best engineer. Then around that time, we all had widespread instant access to pretty much all the knowledge we needed you know, via Google or, or whatever, and the emphasis shifted. Employers started looking for things in addition to technical mastery, critical thinking, creativity, and the ability to ideate, the ability to engage with clients, working in high performance and particularly multicultural and diverse teams, quality control, risk project management, all that all started to feature. So what are the next set of skills that employers will be looking for? We'll, we'll dive into the answer and the panelists will explore this in some detail today. But need, needless to say, it's an ever growing list. And as we learn these additional new skills, we still need to stay on top of our technical specialist areas um, and all the other, all the other uh, areas that have made us uh, professionally capable in the past. But, but I'd just like to talk about universities and their role in this landscape of learning. Traditionally, the role that our universities have taken, of course, has been built primarily on the undergraduate Bachelor of Engineering degree with, with Engineers Australia accreditation that delivers stage one competencies. Until now, most universities, including ours, have felt most comfortable extending that same model to a postgraduate level, e.g. getting students back to do a master's degree of some sort. For example, one of our most popular degrees is our accredited masters, where overseas students can, can gain accreditation to stage one competencies as a professional engineer. However, more and more we see demand for ongoing short courses, what we call micro-credentials, short courses that come with accreditation, with assessment, such that over time they can be ganged up to, to be a formal degree of some sort. But we all need access to these ongoing learnings, but we all need access when we need them and in a form that can fit into the rest of our busy lives. UNSW uh, graduates more than in, in more engineers than any other uni in Australia. We're the biggest. We're, uh, there's all sorts of metrics I can quote to you that show how good we are, but I'm not going to bore you with them. But we did feel an obligation to the profession to reimagine how we deliver continuous and lifelong learning. Our new initiative, the Australian Graduate School of Engineering, which we're, we're launching for courses next year, does that. When we were first thinking about lifelong learning, and how best to promote and support it, we were a bit surprised to find that as far as we could determine, no universities in Australia really identify and deliver education to an experienced adult student cohort via tailor-made model. The AGC will take a very different approach. It draws many of its ideas from the UNSW Australian Graduate School of Management, which has been operating for about 40 years now, and extends that to a broad range of topics that we'll be touching on today. For all that we think AGSE provides an ideal model for lifelong learning, I do want to emphasise that self-driven, embedded, on-the-job, hands-on learning is profoundly important. If you dig out, for example, the list of stage two competencies and read through it, plenty of us will learn much of this on the job, and so we should. But for other things, a course will be much quicker, more efficient and more complete pathway to gain that knowledge. So thank you. Uh, and on that note, I'll finish up and uh, hand back to Pamela. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for kicking off, off on a conversation regarding both the normality yet the pace of change and how lifelong learning will help us address that. I'll now like to welcome the remaining panel members for today's discussion, and I'll start by introducing Louise Adams. Louise is Oricon's Chief Operating Officer. She's responsible for driving the financial, operational and people performance across all areas of the business to achieve the group's strategic business goals. Reporting into Oricon's Group CEO, Louise is a member of the Group Executive Leadership Team. Prior to her current role, Louise was the Chief Executive for Australia and New Zealand, overseeing a workforce of over 4,000 people involved in the delivery of infrastructure solutions in the transportation, water, defence, built environment, energy, resources, telecommunications and aviation sections. In previous roles, Louise has made major civil and multidisciplinary projects in the UK, in Australia, Ireland, uh, uh, 
Iran, India and Malaysia, but also Thailand, Laos and, and Singapore and many more countries. Please welcome Louise Adams. I'd also like to welcome our third panellist, who is Penny Joseph. Penny joined Sydney Water in 2013 as a business planning manager, having previously worked in several transformational roles in the solar and aerospace industries. and climate change adaptation, responsible for leading a range of programs designed to enhance the reliability, quality and security of Sydney Water's products and services in the face of a diverse range of challenges. Penny has a Bachelor of First Class, which she completed with UNSW Co-op Program Scholarship. She also has a Master's of Businesses, Business Ad, Admin from the AGSM at UNSW. So please also welcome Penny Joseph. And finally, I'd like to jo um, welcome our fourth panellist, who is Stuart Kahn. Stuart is the Director of the newly established Australian Graduate School of Engineering and also Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales. His research field is water quality and treatment, and he has published over 100 MTP journals on issues relating to trace chemical contaminant drinking water, wastewater, and also recycled water. Stuart is a member of the Water Quality Advisory Committee, Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, and also the Chair of the Recreational Water Quality Advisory Committee to the National Health and Medical Research Council. He's also a member of the National Water Grid Advisory Body, advising the National Water Grid Authority and the Australian Minister for the Infrastructure on Commonwealth Government Investments in National Water Infrastructure Priorities. In 2015, he was named among Australia's top 100 most influential engineers by Engineers Australia. So please welcome our fourth panellist, Stuart. So our panel will now come together to kick off today's discussion. So please remember, we will be taking audience questions after the discussion, and we'd appreciate if you could put your question in the chat box and who it would be directed to. But let's start with a, a couple of um, initial questions. And I'll, I'll direct a question um, first to Ian. So Ian, can you tell me what is changing in the world of engineering and what does this mean for the profession and also for the practicing engineer? Uh, thanks, Pamela. Um, let me touch on a few of these um, and then I might uh, give, an, have a, give the, uh, the rest of the panel an opportunity to answer as well. Um, in terms of what's changing for engineering, so I, I, I'm going to mention a couple. I think the first one I want to mention is ethics and the consequences of not following a proper ethical framework. So I'm sure all of us know and abide by the EA code of conduct and we have appropriate ethical frameworks within the organisations we work. But as, as the custodians of technology, infrastructure and the environment for humanity, we play a significant role in looking after the planet. And more and more, I think the, these eth ethical frameworks need to be more considered. I think most of us probably have a good sense of ethics, but have we actually studied it? Do we actually know? Is there any analysis behind it all? The field of ethics is bigger than the field of mathematics, for example, if you measure it in terms of how, how much has been written about it, but I don't think many of us study it. And just as a, a, a single case in point, we probably all remember the unfortunate circumstance in Western Australia when a, an unnamed large mining company destroyed a sacred site recently. That was perfectly legal and it went through all the inter their internal processes, yet it was clearly wrong. And there's an example. The second thing I think that's changing the profession of engineering is sustainability, environmental sustainability, in particular, zero, zero carbon solutions. It is the reality that within, you know, within our lifetime, we will be required to produce uh, projects and products with net zero carbon emissions. I don't think we do that at the moment, but we will need to very soon. And I'd just like to ask the audience, if you have a think about one of the projects you're working on at the moment, do you actually know what the net carbon emissions are of the project you're working on or over the lifetime of whatever it is you're making? Um, soon you will be required to, that will be important. Uh, and I'll just pick one more, there's plenty more, but I'll give other people a chance to, to say something. The last one I'd like to mention is global geopolitics. 
most of our um, engineering professions these days are fairly global in nature. We're either working in a, a multinational corporation or part of an organization that fits into global supply chains. Global geopolitics are changing fairly quickly at the moment and, and in impactful ways. You know, positioning and posturing by, by major, com- major countries like the China and the US, a changing legislative framework in Australia. These are all important. And if you're deal, doing with, dealing with business overseas, these are going to be important factors engineers are going to have to consider. So I think I'll, I've rabbit it on enough. I'll leave it at that, Pamela, and I'll, I'll invite others to, to jump in as well. Well, thank you, Ian, um, for promoting and starting our, our thoughts around that pla- around that space, particularly in regard to ethics. Would anyone else like to contribute to the, the point about ethics in engineering? Pamela, I'm happy to build on that. I think uh, it's a really valid point. And I think, um, you know, adding to what we're seeing at the moment in the world, I think it's necessary. People need a point of information and knowledge that they trust. And and I think uh, also building on another point that Ian just made, around the complexity of the sort of problems that we're requiring engineers to solve uh, requires engineers to have a really broad perspective, not just looking at the problem they're solving or the project they're working in in isolation, but that whole piece around sustainability. What is that, what is the role of that project or that solution in that broader context? So I think that um, building that ethics and and being seen as a profession that is bound by very strong um, ethical considerations is going to be really important um, to gain the trust of uh, end users or, or communities or or of governments or people uh, in being able to be key players in solving some of these really complex issues that the world is facing. Terrific. Thanks, Louise. Um, Penny, noting your strong link into the sustainability area, would you like to draw upon your thoughts regarding linking ethics and sustainability and other areas that are particularly relevant to engineers? Those um, items, I think a key thing that's changing is the interdisciplinary um, approach to solving problems. So some of the examples that, that were given there about, you know, trying to achieve net carbon zero, uh, it, it doesn't just require engineers to work by themselves. Um, we need the teams that are doing customer engagement, understand customer sentiments and willingness to pay. We need to have the business development people understand you know what the new business models look like um, we're looking at different types of financing in terms of you know green bonds and and how they may uh, enable projects um, you know we're thinking about how do you operationalize these projects so it's it's really a lot more uh, it, you know that it requires a lot more disciplines than perhaps solving just technical problems um, and so i think it's really important to be effective in enabling outcomes that that you can kind of bring together people with different skill sets um, to progress these wicked problems. Uh, Thank you, Penny. Um, And thank you for demonstrating already the broad and diverse range of skills required. So Ian, how do you see continued education and further development as an important factor in career development and particularly feeding off those um, skills and capabilities that Penny and Louise have already touched upon. Uh, Thanks. So obviously continued learning uh, is critical to anyone's development as a professional. Uh, And some of that learning is street smarts and learning from experience, and I don't want to downplay the importance of that. But some is much better done with formal courses and learning from an expert. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, I guess, illustrate this with a with a personal example, if I may. And it's not it's not actually engineering, but last year I did a course run by the Australian Institute of Company Directors to become a company director. I'd actually been I've been on boards for decades, and I thought I knew everything there was to be a company director. I even had a, had a fair idea of, you know, what good and bad governance looks like. You know, uh, I knew my way around financial reports. Um, 
and uh, I even knew the Corporations uh, Act to a fair degree. So I thought I knew what I was doing, but I thought I'd go and do the course to get the qualification. But what I didn't realise is that all the boards I've been on have actually been fairly functional and I haven't seen the sort of bad behaviours or dysfunctional or, or problem situations that arise and they only became apparent to me because I did the course. So I guess what I'm saying is that lifelong learning is about a balanced uh, on the street experience as well as solid formal education. You, you do need both. What's more than that, employers are looking for employees who are keen to learn new things, obviously. And having a good healthy list of courses on your CV shows both your current and possible future employee, employers how much of a valuable employer you are. Um, if you learn on the job, if you don't do courses, you may get good at it, but if you're looking for a career advancement, you will need to be in a position to convince the person making the choice about giving you that next job in an interview, which is a much harder thing to convince someone of than, than having a written qualification on your CV. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ian. So we've been talking about engineers needing to be multidisciplined. So in this space, what do you think is happening and what are the emerging trends, both what we're seeing now, but where do you, where are you getting the hints of where it's going into the future? Uh, would, would you, you like, like to me to answer that one? Yeah. Thank you, go so, for it. <laughs> um, the, the engineering is multidisciplined, of course. Um, I think what, what we're seeing uh, in terms of the research that we've been doing, actually trying to get an understanding from, from industry about where the uh, needs might be for continuing education, as well as uh, talking to potential uh, students, enrolments, uh, for continuing education, there are really two broad areas. And one is skills that we've talked about, the need uh, for skills like leadership, for, for teamwork, for cooperation, communication skills. Um, so, so very general skills that are absolutely essential to be able to adapt. And, and ad adaptation is what it's going to be all about. I think the pitch for this um, webinar spoke about the rapid pace of, of change. If the world is changing around us, engineers need to be able to respond to that and that takes skills. Uh, the other broad area for, I think, continuing education um, is, as Ian referred to, technical mastery or, or, or knowledge skills, understanding a particular area. When we look at what we might have taught in undergraduate degrees a decade ago, uh, there are areas that really were not very significant a decade ago that are much more significant now. We can talk about the hydrogen economy and machine learning and all sorts of uh, new technical areas which uh, have become significantly more important and will grow and there'll be new ones growing on top of those as we go into the future. So there will always be a need to keep up with current knowledge and to learn new areas of uh, technical mastery within the engineering field. Thank you, Stuart. Um, noting that I'm in the infrastructure space and, and there's an incredibly um, tight skills challenge at the moment, um, what is um, your thoughts on it being in the midst of the infrastructure boom and the shortage of practising engineers? Is there a need for skilling up now? And if so, in what aspects? That question. I'm happy to talk a little bit about that, Pamela. I, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think um, uh, what we've gone through with COVID and, and closed borders and the current scenario and the uh, increased investment in the infrastructure space by government is uh, somewhat exacerbating that skills shortage. So I think it is critical. And if we talk about the pipeline, that's there is an element of that that's a bit more medium to long term. But I think in the short term, one of the opportunities, and this is exactly where, um, you know, these sort of graduate schools can be hugely advantageous, is to be able to take people that perhaps sit in other industries with other skill sets that are um, that are still highly educated, but perhaps have been educated in others, uh, with other skills uh, who have a, a perhaps a, um, a, a, a 
a sort of bent towards engineering or science or maths that we can bring over and provide some sort of bridging uh, short courses that we can you know give them the skill sets that are required particularly in this area of project management or in leadership or in the broader skills that perhaps don't require that deep technical background to go into. So I, I think there's a real opportunity uh, in the short term to address some of the direct specific infrastructure skill shortage, skill shortages that we have through these sort of graduate programs. Terrific, thanks Louise. And Penny, you're in one particular arm of the infrastructure environment, utilities. What is your thoughts in that regard? Yeah, we would probably like to talk about the way people want to learn. Um, I think just drawing on the points, I think that Ian made about the importance of having formal qualifications. I completely endorse that. Um, for my own learning, I've really appreciated being able to get um, new insights from sort of a variety of, of places. So formal courses are, have been really great because, um, you know, they provide you the structure and a bit of routine about learning. Um, but there's also been, you know, some problems that, that I think you come up against that you don't really know that you're going to come up against until you're up against them. Uh, and then it's really helpful to be able to kind of, you know, um, do, do a short course sort of almost on demand or, or sometimes even that's meant, you know, having an expert panel where you can um, perhaps ask a, a panel of experts, you know, what do they think about this particular problem? Um, you know, you know, team of mentors. Um, and so, you know, I think in terms of upskilling people, um, you know, when you've not got a, a lot of time, um, it, it can also be, you know, how do you make available um, abilities to be able to pick up, you know, particular skills almost on demand. Um, but I think what's really great about some of the new offerings from, from the different universities is that you can kind of add up those pieces of learning and, and sort of fit and tailor make your own formal qualifications. So, I think that's um, that's a wonderful thing um, for everybody on the call. Thank you, Penny. Um, just thinking about um, linking the the training into our career paths, um, Stuart and Ian, what would be possible career paths for those with engineering degrees but have more of a creative calling, for example, writing or art? I think many. Uh, I think uh, we, we we want to live in cities, but not just cities. We want to live in beautiful cities. And so I think aesthetics uh, play across engineering very broadly, the way we, we design buildings and houses and other structures, bridges, uh, all have very uh, important aesthetic aspects. And I think if you want to sell anything from a, a mobile phone to a car to a computer, uh, the aesthetics, how it looks and, and, and being attractive and fitting into uh, the environment in which something will be um, is, is, is essential. And so I think there's a real eye to be able to do that. And uh, that is that art aspect. I think in terms of being able to write, um, there is no more important skill um, in engineering than being able to communicate. And so it's, it's one thing to come up with a great idea, but it's worth very little. Uh, if you can't communicate that, if you can't express uh, the values, the, the reasons why this particular solution or idea might be a, the right idea to pursue, uh, then it's probably going to go nowhere. So uh, I think all engineers uh, need to be able to have uh, creative, expert, clear writing and, and other communication skills. Terrific. Thanks, Stuart. And I, I noted before, Ian, you were about to hop in and say something. So what are your thoughts in that regard to the, the broader range of skills capabilities that we see across our engineering cohort? Uh, look, uh, first of all, I would contend uh, with the premise that engineering is not a creative profession. Um, you know, engineering is often about invention, isn't it? Uh, we're always solving problems and to do so, you know, it requires creative solutions. So, you know, if people are interest have a have a a creative bent, I think there's huge opportunities within engineering. And I guess I'd echo uh, Stuart's comments. There's, I think, there's two areas in Australia where, from an engineering perspective, we probably don't do as well as as some of our um, uh, competing nations. Uh, I think in product design and industrial design. 
we, we can all point to examples of high quality industrial design that we've seen that are both high quality from a functional perspective and high quality from an aesthetic perspective. And we often lose part of that in the, in the, in the rush. So I'd encourage people, we need far more of these sorts of people. The other one is in research and innovation. So if your boss comes to you and says, hey, we need a new product, or we need a new thing, or this doesn't work, you're going to have to come up with a creative solution. You're going to have to come up with a better one than the person down the road came up with for yours to be competitive. Um, and uh, so I know, uh, I know someone who, well, actually, I am someone who used to work for a large multinational electronics company. And I pick up electrical equipment, electronics gadgets, and I'm constantly horrified and a bit ashamed at the quality of the user experience. And I'm sure many of you find the same thing. Have you ever walked up to a printer and tried to work out how it works? This is, this is a matter of aesthetics and user, in, user interface. Uh, um, design and ability. It's not technical rocket science, but why as an engineering profession do we often let ourselves down in these areas? And I'd encourage people with a, with a creative bent to put their hand up and get involved in these sorts of areas. Thanks, Ian. And I'm not going to let you go too far on the webinar because I'm going to draw us back to a conversation point we had with Louise before regarding the skills shortage, particularly with the um, border challenges during COVID. How can universities and industry work more collaboratively to address the skills shortage, Ian? No, that, that's thanks, Pam. That's a really good idea. That's a really good question, and and I think so. Universities. Uh, try to find they we, we try to find a curriculum that balances what are the sorts of skills that people will need for their career because in, in your you only do one bachelor of engineering degree right um, what are the skills that are generic and are going to be useful across multiple employers and mul multiple careers versus what is practical useful uh, skills that you need today um, the long-term things, we're pretty good at understanding. That's pretty easy to spot. So we do those. You know, the mathematical underpinnings, all that sort of thing doesn't really change that quickly. The specific on-the-ground skills we need tomorrow, that, they're actually much more difficult for us to spot and predict without a more intimate relationship with, uh, with our industry partners. So I guess the short, the, the short answer to this question is we need to reinforce and build the, the I guess the the closeness of the relationship between industry practitioners that are looking for skills and the universities that are trying to to impart those skills and there's all sorts of ways of doing that we really really like uh, people to come in and give guest lectures for example they're hugely popular with students it may come as no surprise that our students listen and believe our guest lecturers from industry far more than our academics um, uh, so we really encourage everyone to come along and uh, get in touch with your the university you went to or some other the local university. Get in touch with your, your fo former professors and see what they're doing. They'd be very happy to get you in to talk about your experience in industry. Um, we all have industry advisory boards. Um, uh, I mean, I encourage everyone to get involved with that sabbaticals and, and postings in both directions we encourage our academics to spend time out in industry and we welcome our industry partners to come in and spend some time working within the university this is not always easy you know because of the professional pressures that we're all under um, but we're keen to do that and there's one other one which doesn't address the short-term issue but hopefully would address a longer-term issue and that is we all need to be i guess lobbying at a federal level for more uh, government funded CSP places in undergraduate engineering programs. So we generate as many graduate engineers as we possibly can. We don't get paid for any more, there's a limit. We can only generate half as many as the country needs collectively between all the universities. We can only generate half. But the government is not prepared to identify uh, more places in universities for engineers. So we're all lobbying, but the, the, the university's ability to lobby in these areas is pretty limited, right? Because everyone says, well, of course you want more, right? Um, so if the, the more that our industry partners can be in the ear of political decision makers 
uh, with their views as to what skills are required and how they should be uh, imparted, the better for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Noting that I asked um, how, um, how unities and industry can collaborate together to address the skills shortage. What's your, your thoughts on that from industry's perspective? How can the universities collaborate better and, and how can universities support the skills shortage? Um, sorry, was that directed for me? Can I answer that one? Yes, Penny. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I actually feel that the universities are already collaborating very well with industry. Um, we have a number of sort of formal arrangements, informal arrangements, um, particular projects where, where we seek advice um, from uh, different universities. Um, so I, I think one of the things that I have found personally um, working through a number of different challenges is, is a lot of those engagements or relationships start off with, with kind of formal um, terms of reference or, or formal um, projects. But over time, they, they develop to be um, a lot more collaborative, a lot more informal. Um, you know, they, they become the types of relationships you can, you know, just pick up um, the phone and, and ask a particular question to. Um, but, you know, if, if I looked at uh, some of um, the things that we have coming up that I'm, I'm particularly working on, you know, in, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be running a big climate change forum. Um, and we'll have our industry, um, we'll have the university sector, uh, UNSW and, and others um, who will be attending and presenting to all of our uh, champions for, for climate change adaptation um, and we'll be coming along and, and, and in that forum we'll, we'll upskill, you know, maybe about 80, 120 people to understand, you know, all the different climate change projections and, and scenarios. Um, and likewise, you know, we would, you know, attend, um, you know, the different sessions with universities. But um, I would say a lot of those particular relationships have started quite formally and uh and, and in the end of um you know they, they've, they've become really quite really quite informal and i suppose that's just the collaboration continue um, as it progresses thank you penny um so we'll now move into the um, question and answer session and bring our audience into the discussion so just a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, please do so via the chat box. Um, we did also receive some questions on registrations and I'll begin with some of the questions that we received um, beforehand. So Louise, I'll kick off with a question I think um, I'd be keen to see your answer on and it's about purpose. Um, so what do you see purpose as being an important aspect for the evolving engineer to explore? And with the organisations and projects we work with and develop with, um, how can we work on our own purpose as individuals? And that question's from Stephen in Tasmania. So thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. It's a really good question. I think uh, certainly for me and, and in the conversations I've had, this concept of purpose, I mean, hasn't isn't this the one thing that COVID has sort of brought home to us all? And uh, I think that um, I think it's there for I think for everybody we're sort of sitting back and saying what is our purpose and I mean I've I, I'm here in Melbourne so we are coming up to 250 odd days in lockdown in the last 18 months and I can tell you there's you 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 will have needed to have had a, a strong purpose driven reason to sort of get out of your bed and walk down your hallway and go to the same uh, same position I've been sitting in um, staring at this screen as I have for that length of time. So I think there's been a lot of reflection on purpose. I think particularly important for engineers, and this really goes back to a lot of the opening remarks that Ian made, um, the impact that engineers have on community, society and the world in general, and the role that engineers will need to play in solving some of these hugely complex issues around uh, climate change, um, you know, food, energy, water security, around population density, all of these things, the role that we can play and the impact that we have does lend itself to really drawing in people who um, are passionate and driven how to have that in. But because of the complexity and almost, you know, the conversation that we're having today about needing to balance those deep technical skills with those broader skill sets, I think being able to sit back and ask yourself as an engineer, what is your particular passion in that? 
um, you know, in frame and what are you, where are you particularly passionate about having an impact is going to help you really succeed in your career. So I think working firstly uh, for yourself, figuring out what you're passionate about, what drives you, what's going to get you out of bed, um, and 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 then being able to link that to uh, what you do day in day out uh, as an employee, and whether that is uh, going into research or whether that's going into industry or whether it's going into consulting, um, being able to then look at the employer that you're working with and asking yourself, does my purpose really align with their purpose and vision and what that organisation's all about? Um, so I think it's an incredibly uh, important thing and just has been made uh, more important now than perhaps it has been in the past. Which almost uh, links us back to one of Ian's introductory comments about the change in the industry and likewise our own purpose may change as the industry evolves as well. I might now ask a question from Paul in New South Wales. So, and it's a question that either Stuart or Ian may like to answer. So what kind of continuous training is required of an engineer to cope with the changing world and make themselves more relevant? So thank you for Paul in New South Wales. Uh, I think we, we, we've touched on a number of answers to that already. And so we've talked about the need for skills. We've talked about the need for changing um, technical mastery. I think a key thing is to think about what are some of the external pressures um, that, are, that are driving change that engineers will need to respond to. So we have spoken about things like climate change, um, the need to decarbonise. Uh, we, we just heard about population and how population will lead to uh, changes in the way that we, we design and manage cities. Uh, another example, if you think about having to respond to uh, external pressures is, is waste management. We have engineers will need, will need to play a key role in thinking about uh, can we continue to fill our, our oceans and our planets our planet uh, with disposable single-use plastic bottles? I think the answer is clearly no. We need to find solutions to these types of problems, uh, but we need to be creative. What will those solutions be that might involve new materials, things that uh, are more biodegradable in the environment? Uh, it might involve changed processes for waste management, waste collection, recycling. Uh, all of these things are going to be new skills that uh, engineers will need to learn and apply in order to be able to effectively respond to, to changing external pressures. Another key thing is simply adaptation itself, being able to adapt, being able to change, not assuming that the way we've done things for the first 20 years of our engineering career is the way that we will always do things. There, there will be change and we need to be ready for that change and able to respond to those needs for change. Great, thanks, Stuart. Um, you talked about 20 years of the career, but I'm going to ask a question from Jacqueline and Victoria about the graduate engineer. So that very early stage of our engineering careers that I'm sure we can all reflect back on and, and value it highly. So, um, Louise, what are the skills and experience you are looking for in a graduate engineer? Yeah, look, I think it's, it is an interesting question. And I think from we, we sort of assume that if we've got a graduate engineer, then we have the technical capability. So a lot of what we're looking at goes to some of the points that uh, my colleagues have made um, in previous questions is around we're looking for people that uh, can collaborate, that, you know, demonstrate teamwork. And we... We, we sort of have moved beyond just having a one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, as part of our graduate recruitment process. We hold um, sort of, and at the moment, virtual sessions where we bring teams together and we sort of give them challenges and we work with groups of graduates over a, over a day um, or, or over a couple of days to try and figure out who we think is going to suit uh, the consulting world the best. And, you know, part of that is to look at how is it, you know, what, um, what teamwork, how, how do they behave in that team environment? How collaborative are they? Uh, how innovative can they demonstrate being? You know, how do they deal with perhaps a little bit of complexity and ambiguity and, and some of the challenges that we throw at them? Um, and then really how they operate in that environment, that team environment is, is, is critically important to us. And then also looking beyond just what they've done in their um, engineering degree, sort of what other lifestyle choices have they made? What other things are they involved in? Are they involved in sport? And perhaps therefore, do they know and understand what it is to be part of a high performing team? Or have they done other, um, you know, you know other uh, things in their 
in their, co you know, outside of their university and their specific study. So we very much look at that broader uh, skill set um, as being the sort of things that we believe will make, uh, bring in a graduate that will be most successful in the world that we uh, operate in. Thank you, Louise. So that was a question from Jacqueline in Victoria about graduate engineers, but we've got Rodrigo in Queensland asking about postgraduate skills. And in particular, Rodrigo is asking about what postgraduate skills are worth investing time and money in pursuing for career progression. Um, Penny, do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. I think um, with postgraduate skills, um, uh, you know, I would assume that people would have a, like a foundation um, that probably had a base career and they're looking to build on that. Um, so I think in terms of, um, you know, the best ones to invest in, um, I think it's the bringing together of comments that, that have already been made. If You've got to choose a pathway that matches your values. For the people that, you know, they, um, they're talking really passionately about a topic that, that really appeals to them, um, those, those people, and it doesn't matter what, what industry they're in, um, find it very to generate change because they're coming from such an authentic place. I think it's really important to, to think about your own values and, um, and thoughts. Um, then to bring across um, Stuart's uh, point that he made about what are the big problems that, that you are going to, um, you know, really be trying to solve. So if you can kind of draw a Venn diagram of, of those two um, aspects, like what are the big, big problems that need to be solved and then, you know, where does your interest lie in that, I think you probably find a, a happy spot. Um, there's no point um, just going into a, a big problem that needs to be solved if you've got no passion for it, because you know what, you're not you're not going to be successful. Um, you know, you, you're going to look bored um, when, when, when you're talking. And similarly, there's no point probably um, doing something that, that's just passionate if, if there's no need for it. So if you can find that sweet spot, um, and I just um, uh, bring in the point uh, somebody else made, but I think you should also be trying to look at a Venn of of you know what what are potential employee employers and you know what are their values and what are their problems and if you can find a sweet spot of all three, I think you're probably going to find yourself in a little spot where where you're going to be really really successful. Thank you, Penny. Um, I've got a question here from Albert in Western Australia, and we've talked about graduates. We're talking about postgraduates, but Albert's asking a question about um, technology. So, Ian, I thought I'd throw to you, as a high-tech and high-change company, shouldn't engineering be revolutionary instead of evolutionary? What are your thoughts regarding evolution versus revolution? Uh, look, absolutely. Uh, but it's a matter of balancing the two. Um, you know, in, as I was mentioning earlier, my, my field is semiconductor design. and Pretty much every project I did was a balance of the revolutionary and the evolutionary. At the end of the day, we are creating the most reliable, safe, useful, economically and environmentally sustainable solution. If we start each time from scratch with a revolutionary approach, it's not going to be the most efficient. So, so part of the, I guess, the part of the art and the science of being a, a proficient and experienced engineer is knowing how hard to push on the revolution versus how much to evolve what you've currently got. I guess there's no magic answer to that, but we're constantly making those decisions all the time. Wonderful, thanks, Ian. So um, in a time of increased specialisation, I've got a really interesting question here about where does the generalist engineer fit? And I must say, I'm a proud generalist engineer, so where is the generalist fitting into the future of engineering? A great question from Lisa in Queensland. Penny, do you have some thoughts on that? Can I take that? I feel, feel passionate about this one. So um, uh, there's absolutely, first of all, specialised and, and deeply technical people um, in, in, in the profession. And I've got to say, I rely on those types of people every day. And, um, you know, big, big call out to those people. Um, but equally, I think it's really important that you can have people that can overarch pro problems, bring people together, facilitate group work, um, the types of people who 
might have you know gone between different industries will bring new insights will look at a problem quite quite differently um, to perhaps how it's been solved in the past um, you know that can that can take um, perhaps the, the the deeply technical things and be able to describe them and understand them well enough that you can bring a business development person on, on board that journey um, you you know there's there's um, you know lots of opportunities for people to be able to uh, engage you know with the communities and um, bring bring the whole communities on on different journeys to accept you know different types of technologies um, and and it's you know really interesting I think when you get a good match of some of those people that are deep deeply technical and some of the people that are more generalist and you build teams with, with both of those skills um, I think the team is you know much much more likely to be successful as a combination so um, I don't think one's better than the other but I think both are just as important and it's really important that that um that those two um aspects work really closely together terrific thanks penny um a question from regarding generalism now a question that's neither specialist nor generalist is um a question I, ian i think for you to answer is that engineering is moving from hands-on to a more digital based that was part of the evolution that was happening in my mind but probably covid has assisted it so how does this affect further education so the original question was from david in wa uh, thanks pamela and, and a great question and, and i think it affects it pretty profoundly in two in two ways the first way is you know, what we need to learn to keep on top of our, our technical domain. So as more and more digital uh, tools are introduced to our discipline, those are going to be the topics we're going to have to study. You know, there's many areas now where we don't prototype anymore. You know, aircraft these days go straight from simulation and modeling into full production. We don't, we don't build prototypes in many areas. So if you're an aircraft engineer, you need to be fully on top of all the modeling tools that are available. So that's where you need to focus your attention. In the other way it changes is, is how education is provided. We see that the, the vast majority of people undertaking ongoing professional education, either through AGSE or some other method, will be doing it online. Within a university context, when we're, te when we're teaching people something, what we're essentially doing is pre preparing them for professional practice, either as a, as a, as a young engineer or, or as an experienced one. So the, the teaching model is designed to try and match as closely as possible within a teaching environment, the, the environment in which people are going to use those skills. Um, if everyone is working fully online, then the best way to teach people it, how to use the tools is fully online, frankly, because you'll learn how to use them. I've seen exactly the same thing happen with my 11 year old daughter lately. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the coursework uh, offered through AGSC is going to be at a distance. It's going to be digitally based. We have a profound uh, and long term commitment to lab work and hands on work when it's necessary and appropriate. So what we're going to find is a lot of courses that do have physical uh, hands-on lab experience will be a mixture possibly of online learning, maybe residential courses. These are the sorts of models of learning that have been pioneered in the management world for, for many decades now. Uh, and we'll be looking at introducing as many of those models as we possibly can, and probably all of them, because we all come from a different environment and different constraints physically and from a time perspective. Um, but we're going to see much more online learning. Thank you, Ian. And Stuart, I can see you nodding there. Do you have something you'd like to add to that? Uh, yes, well, I was just uh, thinking in, in terms of uh, the digital environments and how we uh, make use of it. I certainly don't think uh, a hands-on physical environment is going to go anywhere for engineers, uh, that we still need to build things in the real world. But uh, it was mentioned in, in the introductions that uh, I'm on an advisory body for the National Water Grid Authority. And I'm fortunate enough um, to be on that um, body with uh, Australia's chief scientist, Cathy Foley. And Dr. Foley has been, I think, very 
influential. She's really changed my way of thinking uh, on that committee, talking about digital twinning. Uh, so where we have the, the, the physical systems that we're trying to understand, to model, to make projections around. Uh, this is water infrastructure, so, so dams and pipelines and rivers. Uh, she's been really putting forward the idea of building digital twins uh, that correspond to actual physical infrastructure so that we can do the what ifs. We, we can start to look at different scenarios. We go into another drought, we change the water allocations, uh, evaporation increases or decreases, market increase or decrease. I mean, the concept is just modeling as we've always done modeling, uh, but I think in a very sophisticated way where you would have, you would look at a very complex system and have as many components of that system um, as would be appropriate uh, to really understand the implications of, of different assumptions and different changes. So I think that kind of digital twinning um, will will be important in many, many areas, certainly in, in manufacturing, in uh, all sorts of utility design, looking at networks, be they the water networks, gas networks, any type of networks, digital networks. Uh, I think these are real opportunities to be able to get to see them before they physically exist. Great, thanks, Stuart. Um, question here in Australia, I'm finding it particularly pertinent um, considering it's Safe Work Month here in New South Wales. So I was just going to throw to the panel generally. Um, Melinda observes that engineers want to move into non-technical things due to the stress involved in technical roles. How do we overcome this? I was just uh, wanting to clarify the question is about how do we clarify, how do we overcome the stress of the technical roles? Um, the question is, engineers want to move into non-technical things due to stress involved in the technical role. How do we overcome it? So I'm reading how do we both overcome the stress, but also overcome um, the impact it then has. Um, just uh, I might give some examples of some um, things that I've done in the past helped really technical people overcome the stress of their roles. Um, I think that a lot of people that are very technical, um, not, not only are their roles stressful, but they also are the types of people who, who, who like to really work in the detail. And, and often I've found that um, they actually need to be able to sort of process their thoughts and ideas with, with somebody that's as technical as them and is really appreciating the, the detail that they've been um, they're working to. So there's one particular person that, that's coming to mind as I answer the question um, and I was able to sort of pair him up with, with, a, with an expert at all um, and that really helped that individual a lot to be able to have somebody that was, was able to really talk through his issue and sort of help him get real clarity about what he needed to do. So, you know, some of those um, things I think can be very, very helpful for highly technical people um, overcoming the stress in their role. I don't think, um, you know, you get the same outcomes by um, sometimes, you know, sending them to a to, to a counsellor or, you know, whereas whereas sometimes being able to actually talk through with, with sort of a mentee, um can be very, very helpful. Um, in terms of the other part of the question, perhaps, about people moving to non-technical roles, of course, that's that's a career path for some people um, that they that they really enjoy. So, um, you know, I think that's a fairly easy transition to make as well for, for people who choose that. And it's about just arming yourself with, um, you know, the, the skills to make the transition. Uh, in terms of making transition, I mean, you know, you know technical or non-technical or, or vice versa, um, or, or even different types of careers. I find that um, the best way to do that is, is that you get on to a project team that has a diverse number of people and then, you know, you sort of get to meet people from different types of, um, you know, skill sets and, and then you can sort of merge yourself into another um, type of career. I think I feel like I've had about, you know, 10 careers in my career so far and each time really that's the way I've done it. So, um, yeah, ho hopefully that answers both parts of that question. 
Great. Thank you, Penny. Um, Louise, I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to listen to the answer because I have a son doing first year civil engineering. Um, so it's a question who's come from Syed in ACT. What would you advise a young engineer on the current entry level opportunities in the engineering industry? Yeah, thanks, Pamela. Look, it's a, it is an interesting question. I think, um, I mean, you know, in the environment that we're currently in, I think they're going to, the opportunities that are going to exist for entry level engineers are going to be quite, um, uh, you know, quite promising. I think the advice that I would give is to look quite broadly. And I think going back to what I said earlier and Penny reiterated, which is really find your passion. Like, what do you think initially you'll be passionate about? Um, and, and then, you know, search, do a lot of research and get as much advice as you can um, on, you know, what sort of employers are out there. Um, I think that sometimes, even though people have gone through university and, and you know, developed the skills of an engineer, sometimes, and I think this is where we all collectively, be it the universities or industry or Engineers Australia can work together, is actually building the broad brand of what an engineer can be, because it's sort of this limitless potential uh, environment. Um, and I do think the exciting thing about for engineers that are coming out now, and this is exactly what we're talking about in this panel, is the idea that you can just go down one pathway knowing that, uh, you know, with the evolve evolution, the, the evolutionary requirements for engineering and the access to some of these postgraduate uh, um, skills, uh, capability and learning opportunities, you can always change path if it's not something that's quite for you. So I think uh, in the current environment with the investment in government into infrastructure, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Um, and, you know, some of those opportunities are probably in sectors that um, you and I, Pamela, are quite aligned to in the uh, infrastructure sector. So go and start there. Now, if you turn around uh, down a little bit down the path, a couple of years down the path and say, you know, I've done that, now I want to try something else, then, I mean, the whole intent of this panel is to say that you know, the future of work is such that you probably have the freedom to do so. So I think quite positive um, and, and perhaps a little bit more free to move around within your career than, than perhaps when we graduated. I'd probably just like to add to that. I would really encourage people, young people, to, to um, take the plunge into something that they might not necessarily feel, you know, confident about. I can remember as a young engineer, um, you know, stepping into the, the shop floor at, at, at Airbus and there's this big aeroplane and, and my job was to improve it. And, and, you know, that's quite an intimidating experience. But I think if, um, if for young people is if they can take that plunge anyway, because, you know, you're going to be, be in those places with, with lots of mentors, you know, that you're going to learn to break down problems. Um, you know, you know that, you know, you're actually going to be able to work through those, those problems. So, just an encouragement to young people to, to have the confidence to do that. I think that's really important. Great, thanks, Penny. Um, on, on a somewhat um, related topic, I've got a question for Ian here, and it's from Ron Royce. Um, Ian, would you agree that most universities by the book engineers lack the practical hands-on experience to get the full engineering picture? Uh, yes, I would agree 100% with that. Um, but but by the same token, I would say that it's just not feasible or practical to expect uh, an, a graduate engineer coming out of university to have the full engineering picture uh, for a number of reasons. And that is that you know we we ha you know we we offer quite a broad range of programs, m more than anyone else, and, and there's dozens and dozens of them, but we can't tailor graduates to every single job. It's just not possible for us to do that. And, and I don't think we'd want to anyway. We, we need to give the graduates the skills that they need in order to build a career. So, and, and in my opening statement, I, I think I said, it's what's super important is the mix of formal education and self-driven on the job learning by experience. And so just like every other university in Australia, in order to graduate from UNSW, you need to do a certain amount of industrial training. You need to have some experience. But our, our, our students want to get out of university as fast as possible and into a job and learn there as well. And so our, I don't think it is our job to actually generate 
full engineers. And, and I guess part of the topic of today is that, well, are any of us full engineers? Lifelong learning, we're always going to learn the next thing. So, so I do agree with the, with the statement, absolutely. Um, but I'd just like to calibrate what the expectations are of people coming out of university as an, at an undergraduate level. Just like to add something um, to that, um, uh, just regarding the current context. I know the question was directed at people leaving university, um, but I think it's important to think about some of that in terms of the COVID context. I know children in, in year ten and, and year eleven, and this is the first you know co cohort of kids that never did work experience. Um, I know you know currently we're, we're not taking you know a lot of um, you know training students on. Uh, because of the COVID restrictions. And so I, I think a, as an engineering community, um, we do have to um, you know, do a little bit better at, at explaining what an engineer does um, you know, to some of those students that are coming through. A very um, valid observation, Penny. Thank you for that. I'm now going to ask a question from Robert Friff, um, which has been submitted, but a couple of other people have followed up on it. So Robert has posed a statement, then, then asked a question, and it's to the panel in general. The comment from Robert is, we should maintain currency in our technical discipline unless we wish to move out of technical aspects. Can any of the speakers comment on the arbitrary nature of requiring risk and management CPD? I'm uh, look. I'm happy to talk from a from a perspective of of Oricon and the business that we're in, which is consulting. I think, uh, as I say, we even with our deeply technical, technically eminent people, we um, talk about what we call the T, which is the stem of the T being your deep technical expertise, and the top of the T being the broader skill sets that you require. And those broader skill sets, we've touched on some of them today, and touched on. Um, you know, in a number of the conversations that we've spoken about, but I would say very much that understanding risk uh, fits into that uh, that broader skill set and and things like management and pro be it project management, be it contract management, or even be it business management, um, become quite incredibly important for us to broaden those skills. And when you come into the consulting world, there's a reason for it because uh, really we need to be able to contextualise the work that we are doing, even as technical experts, in the world of where our clients are coming from. And often our clients will come to us um, and they will uh, pitch problems to us or, or get us involved in problem in, um, solve, in solutions, providing them with solutions for problems where we could easily, with our deep technical expert hats on, say, well, their problem is safety or their problem is they need to build a bridge that goes from A to B. But often in the client's world, their problem might be, in the case of government, they might simply want to provide jobs for, um, for, for the maximum amount of people, or they might be trying to solve a broader business issue that they have, or they might indeed, in terms of when we look at things like climate change or sustainability, they could be looking at a broader future risk business or um, risk issue that's going to hit their business into the future. So I think uh, they may seem for people that perhaps uh, early on in their career in particular want to stick into that technical area, they might seem quite random, but I can guarantee you that from an organisational perspective, um, and I think from, um, uh, you know, from this evolving engineer's perspective, I think they're critical uh, um, complementary skill sets that, that do need to be continually worked on. Terrific. Thanks, Louise. Um, I've got a question that's focusing back on the, the university models and the evolving engineers and happy for Stuart or Ian to answer this. Can you share some examples of how the university delivery model is adapting, shifting to produce graduate evolving engineers with the capabilities to address the future challenges facing society? And that question is from Robbie Godecki. Well, that sounds like a little bit of a Dorothy Dixer. It was not a planted question, <laughs> but uh, clearly that's, that is the objective. That's um, what we're, we're here to do with the establishment of the Australian Graduate School of Engineering. Uh, it is about trying to identify what are industry's needs, the evolving needs of uh, industry and the evolving needs of, of engineers. So I think we are trying to do things differently. I think it's a model that will be 
uh, broadly adopted uh, across the board by probably all universities in time, uh, because that continuing education, that need to keep up with the rapid pace of change uh, is only going to increase. So, so I think that's one answer. I think also in our, in our existing degree programs, our undergraduate programs and our uh, postgraduate programs, uh, they are also changing. I think uh, more and more are we looking at engaging with industry and making sure that we are rapidly responding to, to industry needs. Uh, things like sustainability assessment uh, didn't exist in, in uh, a conventional undergraduate engineering degree uh, 20 years ago. It's now a very important part of, of the engineering degrees that we teach at, at University of New South Wales. So all of these things um, will need to change as the world changes, industry changes, and as industry changes, the education system, the universities that, that produce the future engineers need to change as well. Great, thank you, um, Stuart. Um, noting we've talked previously about a skill shortage, um, and one of the things we have touched on is diversity in any of our industries, but I've got a, a question here from Farhan Raza, um, directed to Louise, but feel free anyone to answer it. And it's in general, immigrants with diverse backgrounds struggle to secure their first job, forget, forget getting into multinationals altogether. How do Engineers Australia play a role in this? Um, and having said that, um, even getting CPNG and RPEQ status doesn't help. Is there a dis disconnect between EQ and industry requirements? That was a long question. And uh, Louise, I know you've you popped up on screen. So do you want me to restate it or are you, you you're good to answer? No, look, I think. I think I'm good to answer and I think it's a really great question and there's a few layers to it. I do think that Engineers Australia has a role to play in terms of making sure that people that migrate to Australia who have engineering skills and engineering experience can translate that from whatever country they've come from easily into the Australian landscape. I would say though, and I do say this with all seriousness, there is a huge responsibility here on industry and it goes to valuing and being able to identify talent differently to be able to address this diversity issue. So, you know, I mean, and I don't think it's only unique to engineering. Um, you know, my we moved, my husband's English, we moved back to Australia in 2015. We'd lived in the Middle East for eight years and he'd been a debt collector in the UAE and he couldn't get a job here in Australia because they said he didn't have debt collection experience in Australia. And I, I used to tear my hair out because I sat there and said, if you can collect debts in the Middle East, you can absolutely collect debts in Australia. So we have this very Australian centric um, bias towards um, local skills and local experience, which I think leaves a lot of um, extremely talented engineers on the bench. So um, I know that John Holland, uh, a couple of years ago, addressed this problem by specifically targeting migrants and bringing them through a program and trying to engage them into the construction industry. And I think that um, organisations such as John Holland and the contractors and then organisations such as my own, we really have to put um, some uh, goals and targets and, and some processes in place so that when people apply to our organisations that they don't get rejected on, um, you know, on because of these inherent biases in our processes and things like, you know, thou shalt have Victorian experience to work in Victoria. Um, I'm hopeful that this current crunch on um, capability and this current um, massive investment that the government's making, particularly into the infrastructure industry uh, and the skills shortage that comes from having closed borders and the like might, uh, might take us forward a few steps on this journey. But I think it's a really uh, good challenge and I think the onus is on um, industry and Engineers Australia to work collectively to try and unlock this talent that is frankly sitting on the bench um, when it could be, um, you know, actively engaged in in um, in what we in in all of the industries that engineers are involved in. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Louise, and and I have to reflect upon an introductory conversation I was having with some new starters in my segment of the business a couple of weeks ago and one out of seven of them did their degree in Australia. 
and less than less than half were English first language and their skills and experience were extraordinary and I'm very excited about the contribution they will make to our industry and the organisation. Um, Penny, I've got a question from Daniel um, and he specifically directed it to you. So, Penny, do you think we are at risk of losing good technical engineering talent by virtue of an ongoing focus and often better remuneration for more humanities-based engineering disciplines? Hmm. Um, it's not a question I have to say I've considered um, previously. Um, I think. I think that those problems are actually being best addressed when you've got the combination of both. So I think, um, you know, I think about the projects that I've been involved with that have had the most success, you've actually got both happening. So you, you need to have deep, deeply technical people. Um, so uh, the, the question about the remuneration, um, you know, as being driving people away from, from technical, um, you know, um, technical roles, I think, is a um, important one to consider. Um, I think sometimes when you look at uh, job profiling, you sometimes are thinking about, well, how how many um, when I talk when I talk about the the level of workability assessments, you have a list of questions that that go into determining someone's remote. so technical assessment would be one aspect. How many people report to the person might be another, and those things build up an assessment of of a job. Um, so I think there does need at times to be recognition of that expertise. Um, there's some companies that, that do that better than others. I know when I worked at Boeing, there was a, a very technical um, stream that, that you could take. It was called the, the Technical Fellowship, I, th I think. So there's certainly um, probably some industries that do that better than others. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think the problems are best solved by um, by, by having, you know, one, you know, you know, a humanity stream over a, a technical stream. I think the problems are best solved when when you have the combination of those two skill sets. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, I think, you know, you know, perhaps there needs to be better recognition um, and, and some organisations there that, that are doing that particularly well. Terrific. Thanks, Penny, for your answer. Um, I've got a, a prime question here from Thomas Fryer, and again, it's to the panel. Um, so can the panel discuss whether change is as fast as some believe it is? Um, Thomas sees the key challenges for engineers is that additional considerations constraints are imposed on our designers and trends to digitisation and increased value being placed on communication are tools that we're using to handle these change. So, Question to anyone in the panel: Are the changes as fast as we believe they are, or we are being, or are we being constrained by additional considerations imposed on our designs? Yeah, Pamela. Look, I'm happy to have a little bit of a go at it, and then uh, open it up to my fellow panelists. Um, I think I'd probably answer yes to both the questions. I think that. Uh, change is as fast as we believe it is. Um, and I think we need, we, if we look at, certainly from for from the perspective of the industries that, uh, that my organisation operates in, if we look beyond those industries into other industries, we can see rapid um, transformation, particularly on digital front. Whereas if you look at some of the industries we're involved in, um, like the construction industry, uh, you know, I've been told second only to hunting the hunting industry in terms of its lack of digital advancement, which is pretty frightening. But um, so I think that the, the change is very fast, and the challenge for us is how do we sort of catch up with it, or at least get you know stay up with it, or get ahead of it, so that we can dictate uh, how we you know how we change the role that an engineers play play, or the role that if we're in an organisation, the role that we play. And, and how competitive we are, we've got to stay ahead of it. Um, I do think that uh, we are somewhat constrained a lot of the time, and, and I think that this is a big part of why the construction industry is perhaps not taking the steps, the, the revolutionary steps forward that it needs to take is 
um, you know, we, we have this, we talked earlier about the role of risk, and I think this is why it is a critical skill set. You know, often um, we get criticised if I talk about Oricon or, or our um, sort of companies like us, we, we'll get criticised for doing what's called gold-plated design. People will say, well, you guys are just over-designing it. We could do it more efficiently. We could do it more innovatively. We could do it differently, but you're over-designing it. But sometimes it is the constraints of the and the requirements of a client or the constraints of a contract that might drive us to have to do that. Um, and therefore, I do think there are some considerations and constraints. And I think that and there is a lot of conversation happening at the moment around the culture of the infrastructure industry and how do we create a culture and how do we create a procurement um, strategy that can foster things like that digital expertise and things like innovation. And even on digital, where you look at, if you go around the world and you look at other countries which perhaps have got further in that digitization of, of things like the construction industry, um, often they'll have done it because the government has somewhat regulated and said, these are the tools that you'll use rather than just this ability to sort of pick and choose the tools, which might mean that you have a portfolio of projects that are all di delivered quite differently. So I think it's a really interesting question, but I would say that uh, change is very fast. And to a certain degree, we're probably our own worst enemies in, in getting a way of, of really being able to keep up with it. Okay, thank you, Louise. I, I don't know if that was necessarily just as a start. I think it was very um, full answer. Thank you. Um, I might ask one of the, the closing questions before I do do a final close, and it's quite a distinct question for you, Professor Khan. Um, so Seb has asked, when will the AGSE um, release the course and how will they be available? Will it be on demand or only via um, live delivery in person or remote? So we are finalising the, the course offerings now. We hope to have them released uh, certainly this year before Christmas, which is not very far away for first delivery uh, in 2022. Uh, so we don't have a precise date just yet, but uh, I think that we're only weeks away from being able to indicate what some of the first uh, offerings will be. Uh, at the moment, I don't see them as being on, available on demand, and that's because uh, the, the the philosophy behind the AGSE, the the in, the approach that we tend to take to um, course delivery, is very interactive. It's about uh, Having bringing in experts, and we we expect to see a large number of experts coming in for in from industry to co-deliver uh, many of our courses, uh, and so it really is uh, something that goes beyond what uh, most courses would be able to deliver just just on demand. It, uh, there, there will be brainstorming, there will be interaction, there will be discussions, and, and these will be a key component of uh, how we learn and how we deliver uh, on on uh, particular types of material. So, um, and, and we intend to have a balance. I think it was mentioned before that uh, some of the courses may well be predominantly online so that they uh, facilitate distance learning. Um, some other courses will be more of a hybrid where uh, material that can be uh, learnt and accessed uh, remotely and online uh, will be made available that way. Uh, however, there will be uh, either face-to-face -face or, or online workshops and classes and direct interaction with, um, with uh, experts in the field. So a, a mix of those things and hopefully a lot more information about that uh, available in the next couple of weeks. All right. Um, thank you very much, Stuart. So I think, sadly, after such a, a rich, evolving and broad ranging conversation today, it is time for us to bring this to a close. We've talked across so many topics um, from purpose to passion um, to deep engineering, the risk elements of engineering, how we can evolve um, ourselves and our industry. I would like to thank um, all of you who have attended today. And please also join me in thanking Louise, Ian, Penny and Stuart for joining us and for their time and insights shared in today's session. I'd also, of course, like to thank Engineers Australia and their industry partner, the University of New South Wales, for making the webinar possible. Um, of course, as with all webinars, we'd appreciate your feedback on the program today to help us improve them for future sessions. 
So if you could please complete a short feedback form, which which is linked in the description box, that would be um, very um, appreciated. So, th so thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you.